tonight. Joel has not uh, spoken in the islands before. He said he's uh, been on his way, I think, from the Philippines, made a stop over here, but uh, he's never actually come over to do a speaking engagement. And Joel is very much sought after, so it's really an honor and a privilege to have him. How many actually have heard uh, Joel in person or seen him on some of the programs? Raise your hand. Let's see. Okay, good. Uh, uh, you can, uh, a number of the programs that uh, Joel has been on, uh, CNN, Headline News, he's been on uh, the Fox Channel, uh, Hannity, he's been on Glenn Beck program, and, and just always riveting uh, in some of the uh, uh, things that he talks about. Really, he talks about Headline News, things that are going on uh, in our world today. He's really an expert on prophecy, and we will have, after Joel speaks, we will have a time of uh, questions and answers if, if you do have those. I'm sure some of you do. And, and we'll take a certain portion of time, and then uh, Joel will be speaking again on Wednesday night, and then we'll take a little bit more time there if you, didn't, if you had a question and we weren't able to answer it if time uh, ran out. But Joel has the ability to take sometimes very complex uh, things that you read in the Bible, and he, he has a way to break it down and boil it down to where it's, it's really understandable. And he's written a number of books, many books dealing with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, a number of novels. His current novel is Implosion. And uh, in the bookstore, you can uh, pick up some of those, and Joel will be uh, doing a book signing after uh, tonight. And uh, he's been an advisor to the likes of Steve... Steve Forbes and Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, the current prime minister there of Israel. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, he's been interviewed on so many different programs, and he's ha had articles in news, uh, news magazines, especially the Jerusalem Post. Uh, plus, he's a very strong, born-again Christian brother, which uh, is a blessing. And he will be talking about events that you read about in the news even today. So why don't we welcome Joel Rosenberg. Aloha. Aloha. What a joy and honor to be with you. Uh, Bill's right. This is my first time uh, to be here to speak on any of the islands, and it really is a great honor and joy, and uh, my wife and three of our four boys are with me tonight. Uh, we have four boys. Our oldest, Caleb, uh, we just dropped off at uh, Biola University as he starts his freshman year, so we're excited about that. <laughs> Bill and Anita's uh, invitation to come here took a little of the edge off of our sadness. We thought, okay, sadness, drop off our first son, go to Hawaii. Okay. Um, <laughs> No, we did pray about it, and fortunately the Lord was <laughs> said yes. So we're very grateful and honored to be here. And Dennis, what a joy to, to see you in, in person. We've heard you play uh, several times over the, over the years, and great to meet your wife as well. We, we really count it an honor. Would you to open your uh, Bibles tonight to Luke chapter 12? We're going to cover you know, quite a bit of ground tonight, but I, I want to root us in a passage of Scripture the Lord Jesus Christ speaking in Luke chapter 12. Our topic is Bible prophecy. And so as you're turning there, and I'll read through the scriptures if you don't have a Bible tonight, but, but you know, the, the reason we're talking about this tonight is uh, we're going to focus a little bit on the Middle East, what's, uh, how Bible prophecy applies to the events that we're seeing unfold in the Middle East and what could uh, be coming in the not-too-distant future. Uh, we are going to talk on Wednesday about Bible prophecy as it relates to the United States. Uh, what it, where are we? Uh, are we, as a country, in end times Bible prophecy? And uh, what is the future of our country? Uh, we're obviously in an enormous amount of danger. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, threats facing us externally, but we also face enormous threats internally. Uh, actually, my new book that, uh, that Bill mentioned, that book is a nonfiction book, Implosion. The subtitle is, Can America Recover from Its Economic and Spiritual Challenges in Time? 
And it's a, it's a question that we're going to look at in, in some depth on Wednesday night and then take your questions. So if you have questions related to the United States and, and where we are, um, you, uh, I would just ask that you save those for Wednesday night because that's going to be our focus. But tonight we're going to talk about Bible prophecy uh, and then we're going to f- uh, apply that in looking at what's going on in the Middle East and trying to connect some dots. But let's start in Luke chapter 12. Uh, beginning in verse 51. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, why do you not analyze this present time? Jesus taught prophecy. He spoke prophecy. He affirmed prophecy. He fulfilled prophecy. It's impossible, biblically, to be a student of or a follower of Jesus Christ and not absorb and internalize Bible prophecy. The only reason we know that Jesus is the Messiah is because he fulfilled so many hundreds of prophecies. He was born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, like the prophet Micah told us he would. He was born of a virgin, like the prophet Isaiah told us he would be. He lived and ministered in the Galilee, like the prophet Isaiah told us he would be, uh, he would, and, and, and so on and so forth, up to and including the death of the Messiah, how he would die, where he would die, the brutality in which his death would occur, the reason that he would be tortured and, and, and executed by evil men, the fact that he rose again was foretold by the prophets. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy that, uh, that his father spoke through the ancient Hebrew prophets. And this is what gives us confidence that we serve a risen Savior, that we serve a Savior who himself is God, who himself is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He knows all. He sees all. He is all-powerful even over death. God. This is our Messiah. This is our Savior, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus spoke about prophecy. He taught prophecy. He gave us prophecies about his second coming, and those will be fulfilled also. Maybe sooner than the skeptics and the sinners think, even sooner than some of us might think. Now, I'm not Harold Camping, so I don't know the day and the hour, you know, that Jesus is coming back, okay? I don't know when that's going to happen. So if that's one of your questions tonight, uh, don't, you, you just, I, I'm answering it now, I don't know. <laughs> okay? In fact, I think that those of us who teach and, and those of us who study Bible prophecy, one of the most important phrases that we can, uh, that we can get comfortable with saying, I don't know. Now, there are things we can know that the scriptures tell us, and it's often those of us who say, I don't know, to a question related to Bible prophecy is because we haven't really studied it. Or we haven't studied it carefully. 
or we haven't studied it in context. But, but sometimes there are things that God just simply does not tell us. And we have to be careful as students and as teachers of Bible prophecy not to extrapolate what we do know based on the things that God has. told us and create our own theories and present those either to ourselves or to others as fact. Okay? Now, now when you're writing fiction, as I do, uh, because I'm a failed political consultant, okay, can I just be, I mean, it was nice to, for him to say I, I, I was an advisor to Steve Forbes. Yeah, I helped him lose two presidential campaigns <laughs> and about $70 million of his daughter's inheritance money. So, you know, let's not overstate that, okay? Yes, it's true that I was an aide to a then former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, on his comeback campaign team. Okay? It took him nine years to come back, and I didn't help him at all at that point. So I just want to be clear that what, what I did is I got out of politics, I went through political detox, uh, I, got, I got out, I got clean. Uh, <laughs> This time of year I have a patch because, uh, so, so please don't ask me a partisan political question tonight either because if I start to answer my wife will have to come and just, you know, up my dosage. So just, um, but I shifted out of politics and I started writing novels. You know, people thought I was writing fiction when I worked for Rush Limbaugh as his research director, but no, I mean, I actually... But one of the reasons I write novels is because it has a way of capturing people's imagination and, and playing out how Bible prophecy might come true. Okay, there's a difference. I also write nonfiction books. Implosion is one of them. Epicenter is another book that deals specifically with prophecy related to events in the Middle East. But I write nonfiction books to say, okay, this is what the Bible says and this is what it means and this is how we can apply it. But I write novels in part so that I can extrapolate out how these prophecies might come true in our lifetime. You see, there's a difference. We don't know, for example, exactly how the prophecies of the War of Gog and Magog are going to play out. Those are the prophecies found in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Those are the famous prophecies that say that in the last days, uh, Russia is going to have a dictator, and it's going to form an alliance with Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, and a group of other Middle Eastern countries, and they're going to come and surround Israel and attack Israel and try to overtake and both destroy and uh, uh, kind of consume Israel in, quote, the last days of history, unquote. That term, the last days, is mentioned in the text. And so we know it's an end times prophecy, and it's a fascinating prophecy. I, it, it, to me, it's one of the most fascinating prophecy for me. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, the grandson of immigrants, who, uh, Jewish, Orthodox Jewish immigrants who escaped out of Russia uh, to come to the United States to find religious and political freedom. And it's here that my family found the Messiah. Well, not here in Hawaii, but, you know, <laughs> back on the continent. But, but it's in the United States that we, that we found Jesus, that he is the Messiah that he did fulfill all these prophecies. Uh, so I have a fascination with, as a, as a Jewish believer in Jesus, whose family is from Russia, and I had this privilege of working even for a brief season for the Prime Minister of Israel, I'm intrigued with the idea of Russia and Iran forming an alliance with other countries to attack Israel in the last days of history, since I believe we're in the last days of history. So these prophecies in Ezekiel 38 and 39 come right after the prophecies of Ezekiel 36 and 37. Those are the famous prophecies that say that in the last days of history, Israel will be reborn as a country. That Jews will, will come back to the land of Israel after being scattered in, in, in exile for hundreds and thousands of years. These are the prophecies that say that Jews will not only come back to the Holy Land and that Israel will be re prophetically reborn, but that the Jews will make the deserts bloom with God's help will rebuild the ancient ruins. These prophecies have come true. And, and, and those prophecies in Ezekiel 36 and 37 also include that after the physical 
rebirth of the state of Israel, then the spiritual rebirth of the Jewish people will begin. In other words, after Israel becomes a country again in the last days, Ezekiel tells us, the Lord tells us through Ezekiel, that then after the physical rebirth of Israel, that gets set into motion, then Jews will start coming back to faith. God will begin to breathe His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, His life, back into the Jewish people. And this is coming true as well. In 1948, there were only about 23 known Jewish followers or Jesus in the entire land of Israel. 1948, the year of the prophetic rebirth of the state of Israel, there were less than two dozen, or roughly two dozen, Jewish believers that Jesus was in fact, is in fact the Messiah. In all of Israel. That's like those rows. In all of the land of Israel. Now today, there are some 15,000 Jewish believers in Jesus in Israel. The numbers are growing, and most of that growth has been in the last 10 years. Much of that has been in the last 5 years. You see, this is what the Bible said. This is what the prophecies through Ezekiel told us. was the first the physical rebirth of Israel would begin, and then the second trailing the spiritual rebirth of Israel would begin. And that's what we're seeing happen. Now, I'm, I'm transfixed by that. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by that, in part because my family came to faith after the rebirth of Israel. Okay? My father came to faith in Jesus as Messiah in 1973, just six months after my Gentile mother had come to faith. And my father thought he was the first Jewish person since the Apostle Paul <laughs> that believed this. No, I, you, you laugh, but... He didn't, he'd never heard of a Jewish person believing that Jesus is the Messiah since the New Testament. He'd never met. It, it, the, the, the idea was, was unfathomable to him. So in 1973, he thought he was the first and the only. And then I came to faith later. And now all of my four boys have come to faith in Jesus as Messiah. Uh, Caleb, who's in college now. Caleb, Jacob, Jonah, and Noah. Um, <laughs> the ages, I'm going to round them just for tonight, but 18, 16, 14, and 8. Now you say, well, there's a little gap there between Jonah and Noah. Why did he have Noah? And I, my answer to that is because Jesus said in Matthew 24 that he, he's not, if we're holding him back, if we're holding him back, we'd better have a Noah, right? So we have Noah. Noah's here tonight. He's eight years old. He gave his life to Jesus as Messiah a few years ago. Amen. Woo! <laughs> So we're got getting, uh, he's, they've all been baptized in Israel at their own desire. And as we were getting out of the car tonight, he said, preach it, Dad. So, <laughs> amen. So we, we believe that God is breathing life back into the Jewish people. In fact, worldwide, when I was born, that was in 1967, uh, there were maybe, maybe 2,000 who believed at that point that Jesus is the Messiah. 2,000. Now today, we believe there are between 250 and 300,000 Jewish people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and we're a part of that. Now, you're talking still about 14 or 15 million Jews, so we're not there yet. But we're, we're heading towards another prophecy. We're heading towards a Romans 11, 26 world, where all of Israel will be saved. Now, does that mean every Jewish person between today and the end of the tribulation, every single one of them is going to be saved? No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that by the person on the planet who survives the tribulation will have come to faith in Jesus as Messiah. And that many, of course, will have come to faith along the way, but will uh, either be raptured, or if they don't come to faith until after the rapture, will come to faith and be martyred, or die in some other way during the tribulation. But that's where we're headed. We're headed towards a Romans 11:26 world, a world in which all of Israel will be saved. 
So Bible prophecy means an awful lot to me. And that, but, but, but the reason I write novels is because I don't know how it's all going to play out. I can't tell you is going to come to pass. There's, an all, there's all kinds of ways it could come to pass. And in my novel series that began with the last jihad and then the last days, the Ezekiel option, the Copper Scroll, and Dead Heat, that series of five novels was one way of looking at it, one way that it might play out. Now, it just happens that the first novel, The Last Jihad, the first page of that puts you inside the cockpit of a jet plane that had been hijacked by radical Islamic terrorists coming in on a kamikaze attack mission into an American city. I wrote that nine months before September 11th. On the United States, to a war between the United States and Saddam Hussein over the link between terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. That, I was finishing that novel on the morning of September 11th, 2001, in our home, our little townhouse that was right near Washington Dulles Airport. I was finishing it on the morning of September 11th. So as I'm typing and Lynn is dropping uh, the kids off at school, she hears on the radio what be has begun to play out in New York City. And by the time she gets home and tells me to turn on the news, what's happening, we find out that at that moment, Flight 77 was being hijacked from our own airport to our home and into the Pentagon. Now, that series of novels had, a, had some uncanny connections uh, to seem, they, they seem to, to foreshadow some of the events that really began to happen. In the last days, for example, the second novel, uh, the book begins with the death of Yasser Arafat and um, uh, a, a U.S. diplomatic convoy driving into Gaza as part of the peace process when the convoy is attacked. Now, six days before the last days was released, uh, as a novel in the fall of 2003, a U.S. diplomatic convoy driving into Gaza as part of the peace process was attacked. This is what triggered U.S. News and World Report to do an article, a short article about me and the, and the novel, and they described me as a modern Nostradamus. And at that point, they said, watch out, Yasser Arafat, Rosenberg offs you on page 44. <laughs> now, let me be clear on a few things. First of all, uh, it didn't happen exactly the way I wrote in either books. You know, I wasn't writing prophecy. I was writing a series of books about how prophecy might come true. That's the first thing. Second thing, um, I didn't offer. have any personal connection to him. I, I prayed for him. I ho hope he came to Jesus. I don't know that he did, but, um, but when I was working on the next novel, I was doing research in Turkey, and I got a call from a bunch of, well, from my publicist saying that Arafat has just died, and now uh, all these radio stations want to talk to you about, well, what's going to happen next? Because you seem to be this modern Nostradamus, right? Now, that's the third point. I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not a modern Nostradamus. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a clairvoyant. I don't call Miss Cleo in the middle of the night to get my plot ideas, okay? <laughs> what I'm doing is saying, okay, here's what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says about these prophecies. And then I'm going to I'm going to extrapolate. I'm going to about how it happens. Now I'm going to try to back it up and say, what if See, every, every political thriller writer, every good thriller writer, needs to start with a, a, a compelling what-if statement. In my case, it was what if the war of Gog and Magog happens in my lifetime? Not saying it will, don't know if it will, but what if it did? What would it look like? How might we get geopolitically from where we were in January of 2001, when I began writing the series, to the actual fulfillment of those prophecies. None of us know exactly, but that's the difference 
between saying to people, here's how it could play out. Why don't you think about it? And what that has done is it's generated an awful lot of interest in, in, the, in the prophecies. Do you know that Tyndale, my publisher for the third novel, I switched from a secular publisher who, who was doing well with the first two but just didn't know where I was going with this and couldn't quite get their hands around it. They just didn't get it. So I switched to Tyndale House Publishers, and they're a Christian publisher, a wonderful publisher, and, but they wanted to publish my third novel, The Ezekiel Option, which, by the way, begins with a dictator rising to power in Russia and then uh, forms this alliance with Iran. And then in the book... Uh, wipe Israel off the map. Now, the very day that the Ezekiel option was released, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad became the president of Iran. I was actually on the Sean Hannity radio show that day as that we were releasing my book and, and Ahmadinejad had just won the election. But five months after he became president, Ahmadinejad said, we're going to wipe Israel off the map. So that was uncanny, and, 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 it, and it drew attention both to the novel, but also I, 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 I would tell people, look, I'm not Nostradamus. I can't tell you. I'm guessing at those type of geopolitical details. But let's, ta let's go back to the text. What is the about the prophecy? In fact, Tyndale didn't even want to call it the Ezekiel option. Why? Because I, I had an argument with them. It was a loving, kind Christian argument, but still. <laughs> they said, you know, Ezekiel's got to be the most boring name in the Bible. You can't name a thriller after Ezekiel. And I said, well, it's actually the most exciting, one of the most exciting books of the Bible. Let's rebrand the Ezekiel. Let's get that out there, you know? And they're like, I don't see it. You know, but it did, you know, become a New York Times bestseller and won the best book of the year that year. So it all worked out. But the point is fiction has a way of grabbing, capturing people's attention and drawing them. And that's one of my goals, personally. I, you know, when you're writing a novel, when you're writing a story, well, first of all, you just hope that when your, your first novel comes out, that your mother can find it at a bookstore within 100 miles of her house, right? You're not hoping that it becomes successful. You just hope that it's findable, okay? But the other goal of writing a, a novel, a thriller, certainly, is you want people to not ask, uh, you know, like, like kids in a, in, a, in a chemistry class, you know, when is this class over? You want to ask, you know, it's not when does this end, but how does it end? Not when does this thing end, how does it end? You want to get and hold and draw in people. They may never have thought about before. Bible prophecy is far more important than novels. No, novels are just a way of getting people to think about these things. But the prophecies themselves are compelling. And Jesus is talking here in Luke chapter 12, and he's saying, listen, you're all fascinated with the Weather Channel. He didn't say it that way, but <laughs> hold with me for a second. He said, you're all fascinated. When you see clouds rising, in a certain direction, this is, this is, these directions are Israel-based. I don't know how it all plays out here in Hawaii. But in this case, if you see a cloud rising in the west, that is, off the Mediterranean, then you think, oh, a shower. Eventually on land, that's a good thing in Israel. Rain is a good thing because they don't get a lot of it. But if you feel a wind coming from the south, that's not a good thing. That's coming off the desert. That means it's going to be a very, very hot day. And in fact, they have, uh, there's an Arabic term for this called a hamsin, which is just intensely hot, dry desert winds blowing through, and it's not a pretty picture. It happens to this day. But Jesus says, you're all interested in the weather channel. You're all fascinated with what's going to happen with the weather. I tell my boys, you know, look, if you, if you younger boys can't think of what you're going to do for college, that's fantastic. I, I, I commend you because I tell my kids, listen, what job can you think of in which you don't have to be ever right? <laughs> now, Pete, you, you may not be the most beloved person in your community, uh, but 
uh, you know, but, it, but you don't have to be right and you still have your job. I mean, <laughs> Al Roker's figured this out. He, he is a very nice and likable person, but he, you know, seriously, do, spend a couple weeks just tracking how often they're right. They're not that much. And so I think, really, we spend enormous millions of dollars in Doppler radar and all kinds of stuff. Really, you know, why don't you just watch Romper Room when the, when the rain comes. We get obsessed with knowing what the weather's going to be like. And we don't really take seriously what the times are like, what's going to happen, how God's going to play out the things that he told us in advance would happen. What he's saying in the context of this is, gentlemen, ladies, you know the Messiah is coming, right? And there's some prophecies that indicate in the Jewish Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, there, there's a whole list of things that will happen. Hello! I, you know, again, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but Jesus said, in front of them and they can't see it. They are not trying to connect the dots. They're not looking at the text of scripture and saying, this is, these are all the things that God said the Messiah would be like. This is all the stuff that he said about the Messiah. Let's build our checklist from the text, from the scriptures, and then compare it to anyone who comes along that we might think might be the Messiah. And in this case, Jesus was hitting every single one. Check Check, 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 check. And they weren't seeing it. But those who would see it had to realize that when you realize that Jesus is the Messiah, just by a show of hands, how many of you are, were the first believer in your nuclear or extended family, the first person to ever receive Christ in your family. Okay, so quite a few. My father, first in his family. My mother, first in her family. My wife, first in her family. So now I came to faith through my parents, so I'm not a first in my family. But I call these beachheads. These are people who take the beach. They're the first person on the, you know, you saw uh, you know, well, that was the Atlantic, I realized, but just, you know, you saw Saving Private Ryan. It's, that was hard to take the beach. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and we're... Hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people over the years, because I'm fascinated with, with how people come to faith. And I say, you know, did you expect everyone in your family to be excited for you and to say yes? And of course they did. And, and, and um, you know most, and uh, but it often doesn't work that way. And Jesus is saying, particularly to Jewish people, listen, you got to understand, this is not going to go over well. You, your your family is going to be divided. He says, do do you suppose, verse fifty one, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. Now you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, time out. Isaiah chapter 9. Well, aren't you supposed to reconcile us between us and God? I mean, aren't you supposed to bring, bring peace? I, I, I thought you're the, you're the peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, you know? Yeah, that's true. Jesus does come to bring peace between us and God and between us and other believers. In the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to be united in Christ. But between us and unbelievers, often, not always, but often, it's going to create division especially in families. I don't know, I, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a, you know, I, I, don't, I don't handle, you know, family practice in, in any way. I can't tell you why families rip over this, but they do. And we have to be prepared to want to and need to share the gospel with every person in our family in a winsome, compelling, effective, as much as we can be effective way but we have to understand it's going to divide. Not everyone's going to believe. It's exciting over, over, over years, sometimes over weeks or days, but often over years, sometimes over decades, 
sometimes over a lifetime, how one person in the family will come to faith, and then maybe another. Sometimes whole families get saved. It happens in the Bible. It happens in our lives. But it doesn't always happen. And Jesus is saying, Bible prophecy indicates that a lot of things. The Bible tells us an awful for families. And one of those prophecies is that Jesus is going to bring division to your family. Not because he's trying to divide it, but because he's saying, are you with me or are you against me? And if we're with him, then we have to love him more than our families. We continue to love our families sacrificially, unconditionally. But Jesus said, in a, in a sense, unless you love me more than your family to the point where it may seem like you hate your mother or your father or your sister or brothers, then don't bother following me. Those are, that's tough to hear, but it shows us this is all or nothing. These problems he is. And if that's true, then we give him everything. We don't hold back and say, well, you know, seems like a nice guy, but I don't really want to, you know, blow up my, my family over. I don't want to blow up my job over. I don't want to get fired or, or demoted or, or, or blocked from promotion because in this family or in this, or I'm sorry, in this job or the family business. What about the inheritance? There's all kinds of issues. The prophecy, in part, tells us we're really believing in the right person. But it also tells us, Jesus is foretelling us, that it's going to be difficult. Now, pastors are backing away from teaching about prophecy. A lot of people aren't, uh, just lay people aren't even studying prophecy. It's too difficult. To, there's a few reasons. I'm going to give you four why, and from the perspective of pro, uh, pastors why prophecy isn't being taught. Now, I'm grateful that Pastor Bill is teaching it. And not only teaching it, but he's held this conference for 25, 27 years, something like this. This is important. You're blessed to be at a place where the whole counsel of God is being taught to you. You know, there's over a thousand prophecies in the Bible. If you're planning to not teach them, that's a lot of material that you're skipping over. So the Bible, you're skipping Isaiah, skipping Jeremiah, skipping Ezekiel, skipping Revelation. Revelation, which begins with these words. The book of Revelation, by the way, it's just one Revelation. I know uh, a former vice president said today that, uh, that he was taking a nature walk through Revelations because uh, it was so hot. But it's just one. It's one revelation. It's uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the, the Father was revealing Jesus to people. And specifically starting with John and, and then passing it through. But he, it says, Revelation chapter 1 And, and, a critical and, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Okay? Blessed is he who reads this prophecy, these prophecies, who hear it, and who heed it. Okay? You can't just read it and listen to it and go, all right, whatever. This is not an intellectual exercise. This is about obeying Jesus, no matter what the cost, even if it divides your family, even if it costs you at work, even if in other areas of your life it costs you. The question is, if it's true, you've you got to be all in. Coming to reign over the earth. There will be no elections during the millennial kingdom. Hallelujah. Can I hear an amen? There will not be any political parties at that time. There won't be any attack ads. There won't be any conventions. There won't be... No, it's not going to happen. Jesus is it. He rules from Jerusalem. 
Now you can despise him in your heart, but I, you know, I don't advise that. Uh, but he's going to be reigning. Okay, that's a whole other topic of that. There will be believers and unbelievers. Let me, oh, let me just take that for a second because that's interesting. Uh, well, it's all interesting. But do you realize that in the millennial kingdom? your life without any having to work right it's like going to disney world it's just we're done we have no more work no more ministry we're just coasting we've got a thousand years it's all good well it's all good but well it's not all good see what happens is the bible says in isaiah isaiah says that if a person dies before or, or yeah before the age of a hundred people will go oh wow he was cursed okay so if people in other words, people will be dying during the millennial kingdom, and, you'll, and, you'll, and most people will be living that whole thousand years, but some people will die before their hundredth birthday, and people will go, oh man, I didn't expect that. that. That guy must have been cursed. In other words, he... You've got... And then we come back with Jesus, right, at the second coming, and then we set up the, you know, he sets up the millennial kingdom... Isn't it all believers on day one? Now, first of all, there's, uh, there will be some non-believers who survive the tribulation, but then they get judged. That's Matthew 25, right? But the, so it's true that literally on day one of the tribulation, uh, sorry, of the uh, millennial kingdom, everyone be, will be a believer. Either those of us who were raptured because we were followers of Christ and then we come back with Jesus, we'll be there for the thousand years on this earth. Um, and then those who were believers who made it through, who lived through the tribulation. Not there yet. Well, where do they come from? Outer space, Area 51? I mean, what, what is happening here? No, no, hang with me. We who have been raptured, or those who die in Christ and, you know, and then are resurrected on that day, we have resurrected bodies. Sadly, we cannot get married. We will not be married in the, in the millennial kingdom. Once we're raptured and resurrected, there's no marriage. Now, I have to say this is the one part of Scripture. It's the only part that makes me really sad. Because I don't want to see my wife, Lynn, someday in heaven and go, Hey. <laughs> I don't want her to go, Hey, my old pal Joel. That makes me sad. resurrected uh, but it's sort of like um, you know my my younger kids like Noah for example the idea of marriage not so much <laughs> that sounds like a hideous proposition to him so he, but why because he's not at the point in his life where he's mature enough that he can see and understand the joy of, of, of knowing there's someone that God has chosen just for you he's not there yet I <laughs> Similarly, I'm not at the point where I get fully, I mean, I get it intellectually, but not quite fully in my heart, that there's a point that's going to be something better than what I have now. And that's hard. But the point is, we who are resurrected, and are saved, and live through this relationship, they're not resurrected, are they? So they, get, they start getting married. And they start having children. Now, at that point, these children, you don't get born saved. You are born once of the flesh. Then you need to be born of the Spirit. You have to come to faith in Jesus Christ, right? So these people have to hear the gospel. They have to say yes to Jesus. Now, Jesus will be reigning on the planet from Jerusalem in a new temple, the temple that Ezekiel describes. But we're, there's still going to be evangelism and discipleship. There's going to be vacation Bible school, apparently. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of vacation Bible school. I wasn't. That Worse than Sunday. You know, at the end of the year, I thought, you know, summer came. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Oh, no. What? Now I have to go every day? You're killing me here. And you know what they do in vacation Bible school? They sing. Now, you know, if you're Dennis, well, that's wonderful. You know, if you're Bud, that's wonderful. If you're Joel, not so wonderful. 
I'm not good at singing, and at the time I hated it at the, as a kid. But worse than singing is the crafts. <laughs> I mean, now I, I can picture better ways to spend my summer than gluing elbow macaroni to burlap to write Jesus Loves Me. You know what I'm saying? Discipleship in the Millennial Kingdom. Why? Because there's kids who don't yet know Jesus. Now remember, at the end of the thousand years, what happens? Jesus lets Satan and the demons out of the abyss. And they create the second war of Gog and Magog. This massive attack against Jesus. And they, he, you know, Satan loses again. But the question is, where are all the people coming to join Satan at the end of a thousand years of Jesus reigning on the planet? Where are they coming from? They're coming from people who gave... Since, since Isaiah tells us that anyone, that you're not going to live past a hundred if you haven't received Christ in your heart, and people will be surprised by that. You'll be like, oh, my friend Tom, my, my friend Tom he, oh my gosh, he just dropped dead. How could he drop dead? He, oh, he seemed like he was a believer, but maybe I never shared the gospel with him. Now, this means that at the year 900 or so, there's a massive breakdown in evangelism and discipleship in the Millennial Kingdom. Because... If you're going to have millions and millions of people joining Satan the minute he gets released, then these are people who, came to, who didn't come to Christ, were born, but didn't come to Christ. Fact, and you back it up, you have to say what breaks down at year 900, 905, 910, 920. Some, we, we've gotten, we get, we get lazy apparently. We're not sharing the gospel. So if, you're, if you've never shared the gospel, by the way, or made a disciple, and you're planning to just sneak into heaven incognito, like, whoosh, whoosh, okay, I'm in. Um, this is fantastic. Now I've got a thousand years to do whatever I want. I can surf. I can do, you know, there are a lot of jobs that won't exist at the time, obviously, but, but, but there will. But don't think for a moment that we're not going to be engaged in Bible study, in teaching the Word. Do that to be faithful to the Jesus who's now on the planet. See, this is what prophecy teaches us. The things that we are learning now about how to walk with Jesus, that doesn't like end the moment the rapture happens. That doesn't end the moment we come back for the second coming with Jesus. This is just the beginning. You've got a thousand years of Bible study ahead of you, minimum. <laughs> a thousand, you're like, oh man. Well, I, I, I hope that doesn't discourage you. I hope that's exciting. You, don't you want to be on the, you know, the fast pass list? I don't know how they work it exactly. Jesus, I want to be in your Bible study. I, I want you to teach me directly. How do, I, how do I get to Jerusalem? How do I get to come to the temple and, and hear you explain Part of what's coming is difficult. It's gonna, it requires us to live differently. It requires us to live completely all given over to Jesus. That's what Bible prophecy teaches us. Now, there are four reasons why, why, why pastors are not teaching this. Jesus is saying, you should. He's saying, you know, you hypocrites, you know about, you, you watch the Weather Channel, you're all interested in Isaac, and that's important, but... What about making, connecting the dots between what's happening in our world today and Bible prophecy? People aren't doing it. There's four reasons. One is that many pastors have a lack of belief. It seems ridiculous to them. It, it, it seems it's, it's not intellectual enough for them or, or something. There's some disconnect where they just don't really believe these things are going to come to pass. I'm, a, I'm amazed when we talk about the millennial kingdom. You know, 
in, uh, in Revelation, it says in chapter 20, in verse 2, it says um, that God's going to bind Satan for, quote, a thousand years, unquote. In, chapter th in verse 3, it says, until the thousand years were completed. In verse 4, it says, uh, they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5, it says, the rest of the dead did not come to life again until the thousand years were completed. Prophecy or uh, uh, professors, seminary professors saying, well, that doesn't mean a thousand years. It doesn't. <laughs> Let's read that again. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, six times. No, it's a, well, it, yeah, that doesn't mean a thousand years. It means like for a long time. Well, the Lord doesn't know how to say long time. I, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's in here somewhere. Well, it means like forever. Forever? He doesn't know how to say forever? Well, he's the God of the universe. He made up the English language. You're t he made up Greek. You're telling me he doesn't know how to make the difference between forever or a long time and thousand? No, a thousand years? No, but see, people don't believe. For example, much less all the rest of the scriptures. Why? Because they don't really believe it. There's 340,000 congregations in the United States. We, in those congregations, are supposed to be the light of the world. That's what Jesus said, right? These are supposed to be 340,000 lighthouses in America. And the problem is, and again, we'll talk about this more on Wednesday, but the problem is that too many of these lighthouses, the light is growing dim. Or it has gone out completely. Because there are too many in the pulpit and in the pews who don't actually believe in the power of the Word of God. Many pastors have a lack of knowledge or a lack of training in Bible prophecy. Uh, they, they have not studied it. Uh, they may have taken one class on it, perhaps in, in Bible college or, or, or in seminary, uh, or it, it gotten brought up a few times, but they haven't really been taught it. But that's sad because it's such a huge percentage of the scriptures, right? It's an enormous amount of material that, that many pastors are just skipping over. But, but when you haven't studied it carefully and you haven't been trained in it, you begin to feel like, well, you know, and this could be a right choice. I mean, just to, to stick with me, it, it may be the right decision. In, in a it wrong. We're teaching it badly. But, but that is an, an understandable uh, anxiety that a pastor has. He's, tr he's got a lot of things to do. Uh, he's caring for an awful lot of broken people. He's trying to preach the gospel. He's trying to teach the word that he does understand. He's trying to walk people through the word of God. And if he doesn't have time and hasn't have a background in this, it can, it can be intimidating. And so we need to be praying, one, for pastors to, to believe again in the power of God's word, including Bible prophecy. And two, we need to pray that, that they begin to develop, find congregation through a prophecy and say, you know, there's some of this stuff I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't understand it all. But let's keep going through it. Let's see what the text says. Let's read it. Let's hear it. Let's heed what we know. Let's not just say, no, we're not going to study it because we don't all understand it. Let's walk through it together. But that's the second reason that many pastors don't teach it. Third reason is that Many pastors, they have a fear of being lumped in with prophecy nuts and with those who peddle sensationalism. And that's actually an understandable and right fear. You do not want to be...
sensationalism. This is, you know, I mean, the most recent and sort of wild example, of course, is the Harold Camping example where he, you know, tried to get the whole planet to think that uh, at 6 o'clock on May 21st, 2011, I think it was, uh, that's when Jesus is coming back. That's when the rapture is going to happen. It just so happened that Lynn and I were leading a Joshua Fun tour, uh, that's the ministry that we lead, uh, uh, to Israel, and we were actually scheduled to be on the Mount of Olives that afternoon of that day. And I was going to be teaching from Matthew 24 when Jesus says, nobody knows the day or the hour except Harold. No, no, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't say that. So we were going through it. And I said, listen, people, it's not. More, you just, you're good to go, right? I mean, just wouldn't it be great to be raptured from the Mount of Olives on May 21st, 2011? I don't think it's going to happen. Because how does Harold know if nobody, including the Son of Man, knows? The angels don't know. Only the Father knows. At least at that point. I, mean, I, I, I suspect, I mean, this is just spitballing here, but that, that Jesus knows now. But remember, he emptied himself, Paul tells us in Philippians. He emptied himself to become the, 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 our suffering servant. He emptied himself. Now, the Father gave back to him supernatural power, insight, wisdom, as was needed, but he didn't have all knowledge. I have his book for, I have a little collection that I'm building of books that people have written saying they know, right? I have his book, 1994. It's like 550 pages where he, he does it. Well, I could be wrong, but here's 550 pages of I'm really right. And it was like September something, 1994. It didn't happen. I have on my uh, shelf back home the uh, book by a guy. Uh, it was called the, the 88 Reasons Why Jesus Is Coming in eight, 1988. It's a huge, uh, it sold millions of copies. And uh, then I have his sequel, The 89 Reasons <laughs> Why Jesus Is Actually Coming in 89. He, he claimed that he had miscalculated, but, you know, it didn't happen, right? People have done this. There's... Gave us clues. He told us to be ready. To be ready. And so we don't want to be linked in with those folks, but the only way to not be linked in with them and still be faithful to the whole counsel of God to teach the Bible prophecy, especially as we get close, closer to the return of Christ, is to teach it responsibly. Right? It's to teach it uh, lovingly and compassionately and clearly. And to say, there are things we do not know. And there are things we don't know because God has not told us. And I'm not going to try to mislead you and make you think that I know more than I do. I'm going to teach you what I understand from the scriptures. And then you, you test it. You, you, you compare it. of it because we don't want to be linked in with people who are teaching it badly because they're then the only people teaching it that doesn't that's not that's a that's a bad way to handle it right there are people who miss who who who, who mislead uh, that uh, who teach the bible and say yeah but jesus isn't really the savior or he really wasn't he didn't really come in the flesh or he really didn't rise from the dead there, but we don't stop teaching other parts of orthodox christianity because some people teach it wrong and badly and some do it willfully so we shouldn't do that with Bible prophecy. The fourth point for tonight is some pastors, um, they simply lack an understanding of the times. They don't understand. It would be useful for people to understand, well, what? We don't know when. We don't know the day or hour that Jesus is coming back to get us. But, we, but Jesus gave us a list of things that would be happening in the world, in the church, in society, as we get close to the point of his return. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see all these things, know that he is near, that his hand is right on the door. And when you go through the list that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, 
in Luke chapter 21, in Mark 13, the, the, what the rest of the apostles wrote in the New Testament. You can say, check, 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 check. There's an awful lot of those checks, those boxes that have been checked, which means Jesus' hand is either at or on or near the handle of the door. We need to be getting ready to see Jesus face to face. We need to help people get ready for the fact that if you've received Christ as your Savior, at that moment when Jesus comes for us, we will be gone. We will go with him. And we don't want to be ashamed of ourselves or him be ashamed of us when we see him face to face. This is what the Apostle John wrote to us uh, in 1 John chapter The Apostle John, who, of course, went on to be given the revelation of Jesus Christ, wrote the book of Revelation. John told us in verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2, Now, little children, abide in him. Live in Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Live as a, as, as a friend, as a family member, as a child of God. Walk with Jesus. Abide. Live with him. Remain in him. Why? So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him at shame, in shame at his coming. But when Jesus comes back to get us, when he appears in the heavens and we meet him in the air, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, will you be sh uh, there but shrinking away in shame at his coming? Or are you walking, abiding, living with Jesus, making mistakes, but, but going to 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, if we admit them, he already knows that we've done them. He's all-seeing. He's all-knowing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse. Not others. It's, Jesus says... The, the, the word says that Jesus will forgive us of, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Are we living that way? Are we walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? The prophecies teach us that we're getting closer. When you look at the prophecies about what's happening in Syria, when you look at the prophecies about what's going on in Egypt or in Iran or anywhere else in the Middle East, when you look at the prophecies of what's going on in the church worldwide, when you look at the prophecies and you see what's happening, the natural disasters, the apostasy in the church, lawlessness, You're not abiding with him. You haven't given him everything because you're afraid of dividing your family. And Jesus is saying, I didn't come to bring peace in your family. I came to bring peace between you and me, between you and your father. It might divide your family. But do you want to spend eternity in heaven or don't you? Right? These are the questions. You know, it, it, it's going to be difficult. It might, God might require us to sell everything that we have. He might tell us to move to some other country like Abraham had to do. Mansions. This is not what he's offering. He might get, you know, he might give it to you, but that's not what he's offering. And if, you're into, if your motive is to follow Jesus because you're going to get 
material stuff in this world, you're completely missing his point. You're, you're, you're missing the text. And this is a false teaching. It's a false gospel. It is not good news. It will trap you. If you think that you're going to get stuff here on earth, the Lord may give you stuff so that you can be a blessing to others. He may give you a gift of giving, for example. That's a spiritual gift. Paul talks about it. He may give you resources so that you can give to others. He loved us, and therefore he gave himself for us. And he's saying, will you give yourself back to me, willing to walk with me in purity, in prayer, in fasting, in holiness, until I come back? You're going to make mistakes, I realize that, but you can you then get right on your knees and ask for forgiveness. According to 1 John 1, 9, are you sharing the gospel with those in your family, with those on your block, with those at work, with those at school? Or are you saying, you know what, I'm just trying to get through and not tell people that I'm a follower of Jesus. What's your plan when you're standing in line and you've been saved because you've, you've truly received Christ? Is your boss at work? Is your brother? Is your sister a cousin? You, you fill in the blank. And they're going to hell. They're in line to find out that their name is not written in the book of life. And they're looking over at you and they're saying, you knew this? You knew how to get into heaven, how to get in that line? And you didn't tell me? Well, I didn't think you would listen. You could be right about that, by the way. They might not listen. From him, hopefully, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. What are some of those things? To share the gospel with all creation? to make disciples of all nations. Most Christians don't literally, most American Christians don't know how to make a disciple. They don't know what a disciple is. That could be you tonight. We're going to talk more about that on Wednesday because I believe the number one failure in the church, in the American church, I'm just, just focus here for America for a second. The number one failure of the American church is the failure of discipleship, of transmitting and modeling but also to all others. You know, the, the Great Commission, Jesus said, one of the last things he said was, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't say, unless you're busy, unless you've got kids and it's just a little crazy in your house, you know, unless you don't like other nations, or unless you, you know, don't want to travel, or unless you don't want to walk out your front door, and unless, there's, there's no qualifiers. But yet, many Christians, true, born-again, wonderful believers, are going to get to heaven, and Jesus is going to say, I'm so glad you're here. Show me your disciples. My what? Was that like an important deal? Great commission? You know, you know, I don't want to hear from Jesus what part of the Great Commission, what part of go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, did you not understand, son? I mean, was it in Greek? Okay, actually it was, but... You know, you had all those translations. And yet, for all the evangelism that's being done, we're not actually doing an awful lot to make disciples. 
older believers like Paul, taking a younger believer like Timothy under our wing and investing in their life. And, and I know some of you may have come tonight, and we're going to take questions now. But some of you may have come and say, well, you know, he hasn't talked much about Israel. I want to know about what's going to happen. Will, is there going to be a war? Is there going to be... I'm happy to answer those type of questions the best I can. You come with the Qs. I'll do my best with the As. But I really felt that to begin this, this two-night talk, uh, to, to shift right into what's, going to ha what's happening in the Middle East, how do we connect all the dots, was, was a mistake. I really felt that the Holy Spirit was saying, let's look more broadly for a moment at, at, at why prophecy is important. It's not important primarily to know how many bowls and trumpets and all those facts and details. Those are These trends are coming. This is what's going to happen. And the question for you is, are you ready? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you given all of your life to Jesus Christ? Are you ready to see him face to face and not shrink away in shame when he comes for us? That's the question. Because, you know, and I'll wind up this portion, then we'll go to the Q&A. But with a great verse from Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Um... And it's in verse 10. It's a very interesting verse. I want to know the future. Do you? Do you really want to know all the details of the future? Because some of them are very grim. Some are very, very painful. And, and he was horrified by some of these things. But in this case, he was seeing it. This, this was God's choice. And, and so then it, um, it says, uh, Then I fell at his feet to worship him. This is John falling at the feet of an angel. But, but the angel said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. No, no, don't worship angels. Worship God. Here's the key. For the testimony of Jesus... ...to Jesus. The possi the, the, uh, of, of his first coming. The prophecies of the New Testament point us to Jesus. To his second coming. It tells us how to live, what's coming, how to prepare, how to be faithful, so that we know that we'll be standing one day before Jesus. And that we can be found faithful in his eyes. That's what I want to encourage you as we begin this, this, the two parts of, of my talk. Is, is prophecy, are, are you studying it? Are you, are, are you meditating on it? Are you learning it? What's coming? What is God saying? What is he saying to you? What is he saying to our country? And how should we live? May all of this help you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Amen. Let's take some questions. A bunch of things I like about Joel, but I love the Bible he uses, New American Standard Bible, one I use, uh, the Anointed Bible. <laughs> Joel's just proved that. But, uh, you know, we're going to go until about 9 o'clock, and if uh, you could be seated, just thought you might want to stretch for a minute. Day because he'll do some questions and answers on Wednesday as well. 
Okay, so just get in line. Come on up. Uh, Joe, I love all yes. your books. Uh, <laughs> concerning the building of the third temple, uh, I've read articles on the internet that they possibly want to build it in the northern conjecture. But I, I, don't, I went to Jerusalem. I don't see how that's possible because they got the, at the Temple Mount, they got the Dome of the Rock and the El Las. And if Jews go there to pray, they, you know, World War III will break out. <laughs> I mean, what, what's, what's the possible scenario of the building of the third temple on the Temple Mount? Yeah. Well, the Bible describes, a Bible prophecy, both the Old Testament and the New, describes that there will be not. Ezra, you know, sort of, and then Herod, of course, built it larger and expanded its base. But the third, there'll be a third temple, and then there'll be a fourth. The fourth being Ezekiel's temple. That's the temple that Jesus is going to reign from for the thousand years. He is not, Jesus is not going to reign from this third temple, because that's where the Antichrist is going to take over that temple and desecrate it. That's where the abomination that causes desolation is going to happen. Jesus is not going to reign from a temple that has been ruined, desecrated by the Antichrist. The, sh the, the short version is the Bible is, is intriguing in the sense that it tells us that these other two temples are coming. It does not tell us how it happens. It doesn't tell us uh, the, the process. Um, we have to back it up. That the second, the third temple will be uh, built as a result of the peace treaty that the Antichrist will sign uh, with Israel and the many neighbors. Uh, this comes out of Daniel chapter 9. I don't believe that's accurate, however. Um, it's, it's widely held, even by people who I, you know, I really trust. But here's the thing. In Revelation chapter 11, this is the short version. I can't give you the... Uh, the uh, that's really a doctoral dissertation question that you just asked, but... Um, in, in Revelation 11, it says that there will be two witnesses, um, you know, these the supernatural figures uh, who come and they will prophesy for two guys are going to be standing in front of an operational temple from day one of the seven years of the tribulation. We know that because they're operating for 1,260 days, three and a half years. Then, after, when that's done, they are killed. God allows them to be killed. Their bodies lie there for several days. And then they're resurrected and brought up to heaven. And then, that's at, at that moment, once these two witnesses have been removed from power and from literal physical presence on earth, that's when the Antichrist knows that he has now the freedom to take over the temple. Uh, in one of my novels, I said, well, if fire is raining down from heaven during the war of Gog and Magog battle, you know, when, it, when it, God's judging these things, why doesn't some fire happen to fall on the Temple Mount and destroy the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque? That's one way. There are other ways that, you know, there could be Jewish terrorists. That was another book of mine. And there's all kinds of ways that, that, that the current Islamic facilities that are there could be removed. But I think, it, at the, but I think it, while I don't know, I think it's, it's plausible and reasonable to think that while God is raining fire from heaven on his let's build this thing <laughs> who's going to stop us God just rained fire down from heaven he must be on our side let's do it and they're all set they've got all the preparations made so that's one possibility of how it will happen. Is that helpful? Okay, great. Hello, Joe. Yeah, uh, my name's Danny, and I uh, did done some research with uh, Israel and the Israeli news agencies and stuff like that. With uh, 
I understand that the Israeli Defense Forces, the idea of have uh, uh, the missile called the Jacob III missile, and their latest plans are to put a, a, like a nuclear device, which is an EMP em uh, pulse device, on that missile and blow. Well, uh, I am. Uh, it's actually not the Jacob III. It's the Jericho III. Uh, but look, Israel has the capability to neutralize uh, the Iran nuclear threat. It will be difficult. Um, they are planning for worst case scenarios uh, like they did in 1967. Remember, this is a very similar situation. In, in 1967, it was now, it wasn't Iran that was threatening to wipe the Jews off the map. It was Gamal Abdel Nasser, the head of Egypt, who said, we're going to throw the Jews into the sea. And they were building this alliance around Israel. And Israel had to decide, are we going to strike first, knowing that if we don't, we have to absorb this first blow at their timing. But maybe we strike first. which is the biblical heartland of Israel. And, uh, and on the seventh day, they rested. It went better than they had thought. Now, they have to plan for the worst. The challenge with that scenario, and I'm not saying it's not a, a, a possible idea, but Israel would prefer, I, I believe, to, as it's not surgical, but to try to hit those sites and, and, and do as much damage and set back the nuclear program as far as possible without taking out the entire society. I mean, an, an EMP bomb take out the entire grid, and not just of Iran. It may cover the entire region, including themselves. I mean, it's very dangerous. Now, it could happen. It could even happen inadvertently. Israeli version. Let's just say that happens in the next few weeks, and the entire grid of the entire Middle East goes down, and no, nothing electric is operating. First of all, it's going to be very difficult and hot. Second of all, uh, it's going to be very bad for food, and you can't move vehicles. I mean, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing how bad that is. But it could lead to a scenario in which Ezekiel 38, 39 seems to indicate that this war is happening with horses and, and spears, and you're like, uh, is, that, that, is that metaphoric language? They're using arrows. Well, an Israeli missile system is called the arrow. So maybe Ezekiel was seeing it the best he could. He's like, they're shooting arrows. I heard the word arrow. I'm seeing things flying. It seems Because that requires an electrical charge that it, people are literally shooting bows and arrows and the Lord of the Rings has just come back to life. I, I don't know, <laughs> but The Hobbit's coming out in December. So you, you just have to watch this thing carefully. But let's pray because this war is, it could really be happening at, at nearly any moment. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is just such a treat. Mm. And uh, selfishly, I hope that the Lord puts off his return for a few days because I'm sure we would all enjoy to hear you again on Wednesday. <laughs> it's been so good. Well, selfishly, I hope that he comes back and it's going to be much more interesting than anything I have to say. But <laughs> I, that's very kind. I, I appreciate that. But. <laughs> future events, if any. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Next question. Uh, I, uh, uh. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Um, here's the thing. What, what intrigues me, one of the things, one of many things that intrigues me about Bible prophecy is that God gives a lot of detail about a lot of specific countries that will be key countries in the last days. Israel, of course, is the epicenter. It's the main country that he's focused on, and, but, and, and all the specific countries around it are mentioned. Um, but there's a lot of countries that aren't, and China isn't. 
the only real reference that we have possibly is the kings of the east. That in Revelation it talks about how the king. their forces um, up there. Now that makes sense because uh, the if forces of the east could then take ships theoretically and you know come into the Gulf, Persian Gulf region, dock, and then head right up the uh, Euphrates. Now Euphrates still has water in it currently, but the New York Times just reported uh, about a year ago that it's drying up and, and the Iraqi engineers aren't sure what to do about that. Interesting. Hmm. Um, and, and so so the kings of the east is sort of a broad term. It doesn't give us specificity. It, it could include China. It could include North Korea. It could include Indonesia, India, Pakistan. We don't know. But it makes sense because in, in, in it, it You don't see them show up in the war of Gog and Magog. You don't see them happen, sort of play out in, in uh, any of the other events related to Egypt in Isaiah 19 or in uh, Damascus in Isaiah 17 and uh, Jeremiah 49 where it says Damascus will be just destroyed as a city. But there's not a lot of detail to that. It just, it just happens. We, we don't have any context for that. So uh, given the, 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 how immense and powerful the Chinese military is and is becoming, it does sort of make sense that they would be one of those forces that would come uh, against Israel at, in that last wave uh, of the tribulation. Chinese believers uh, after the Cultural Revolution. But since then, we've seen this massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Chinese people who, who come from this communist atheist system are coming to faith. They're, we believe there's now between 100 and 120 million Chinese who are followers of Christ in China alone. And these people are not being told, you know, if you come to Jesus, you'll get a Rolex. <laughs> hey, you'll get a Learjet. No, what is happening in, in China? What's happening is, People come to Jesus and they're getting beaten, they're being uh, tortured, they're being uh, imprisoned, and they're being executed. And, and so the next door neighbor is watching. Say, hey, hey, what do you have? What are you smoking? Or what are you. What are you taking? What, what, what Zen? What type of yoga? What, tell me what you are doing, that you have hope in the midst of this 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 sadness and this madness. And they say ah, we ah, we don't really want to tell you because you could you could suffer for it. Well, no, tell me. You, if you're my neighbor, tell me. Okay, you need to. We have Jesus. All right, I want Jesus. No, no, I don't know that you do. Yes, I I want Jesus. Well, listen, you're, you're going to be beaten. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be tortured. You're going to be imprisoned. You may very well be executed, you and your entire family. They're like, and that would be different from how. I mean, the people are like, I want what you have. You're going to heaven, and you have a peace. You have a light in your For, the, for that terrible judgment moment at Armageddon, that many of them are coming from China. Let's just say that for a moment. We don't know it for sure, but it's, it's plausible based on the text. God does not intend for them to have, be without witness. And, and, and we're already at the point where maybe one in ten people in China know Jesus Christ personally, and the word is spreading. And that's awesome. And we need to keep praying for the Chinese as we do for Muslims, for Hindus, for everyone else, for Jews, uh, because God won't allow these countries to go into the final moments of, of judgment without having heard that Jesus loves them and he wants to save them and he is saving them if they'll just let them. Okay? Amen.
believe, you know, salvation's nearer than when we first believed, so we're stoked. And then I just started Revelation in church yesterday, so I'm just pumped to even be part of all this. Uh, question on um, the thought that you were bringing up about evangelism and teaching during the millennium uh, with comparing that with like Jeremiah 31, 34 of the New Covenant where he says, mm -hmm. nor will any man teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. So yeah. I'm just curious about that. Well, at that point, everyone will know that Jesus is physically existent, that he really is the king. I mean, there's gonna, a lot that people are going to know about Jesus during the Millennial Kingdom. The, the question is... These things have come true. Who in their right mind is not believing this? Judas. Judas walked with Jesus. I don't mean he's coming back. I'm just saying... Got to be very careful, don't I? I just uh, what I'm saying is Judas type people, people who are Judases, people who can walk with Jesus, see Jesus do miracles, see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. What was going on with Judas? You're like, hello. I mean, are you? You know, as my kids would say, really? You know, how is this possible that you're missing this? But people do. You know, people. Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and him with me. That is a great evangelistic verse. It gives us a picture that Jesus is standing at the door of our heart, knocking. He's not the 82nd airborne. He's not, you know, a thief. He's not going to kick the door in. He's a gentleman. He knocks. If you want to open that door and receive Christ... Then, then you can. And in a moment, we're going to give you that opportunity. To, to, we're going to close in prayer. And, and if you've never made a decision or you're not sure if you've ever received Jesus as your Savior, we're going to give you that opportunity in just a moment. And please, breathe, it's inspired and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But the verse actually is being spoken to a church. Jesus is saying to a church, the church at Laodicea, that in modern day Turkey, or what we now know as Turkey, he's saying to the church, behold, I stand at the door of your church and you won't let me in, but I'm giving you a last chance. Some of you have come out of churches that were that way. You actually spent years. My mom went to a church. My mom's great, great, whatever, her, you know, back in her family, they were Methodist circuit riders. This particular congregation, the light had gone out. This pastor did not know the gospel and was not teaching it. My mom had not heard going to church every week. She had not heard John 3.16. She did not know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him, in Jesus, in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, die and go to hell in the hell fire forever and ever and ever with no way of escape, but shall have eternal life. She never heard that. And this church is, a, is such a dead church that hardly anyone attends. But on Christmas Eve, it was packed. 
You know, everyone was making their annual pilgrimage, you know, whatever, to church, saying, okay, this is probably the thing to do. Anyway, they were there, and they were expecting, and we were expecting, all right, you know, you know preach it. But when he got up and he said, uh, you know, what do we really know about Jesus? We don't know much. Oh, sure, we know the Christmas story, but after that, and he started going through a whole list of things we don't know. We don't know about his childhood. And he gave a bunch of reasons. And we, we know something about when he was 12, but what about when he was 13? Well, what, what about his teenage years? Did he date? Did he, did, you know, was he rejected? Did he pass notes in school? What, what? I mean, he's... What? And my wife and I looked at each other like, what? And if it wasn't out of deference to my in-laws, I would have been like, excuse me. I know. Listen, you had your 20. Could I just have two minutes? I, I, let me just tell you what we know about Jesus. It's so awesome. There's a lot of churches that are not letting Jesus in. And uh, this, is the, this is the world that we live in now. And uh, All right, so... I, let me, let me ask, at, let you ask your, your final question. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I had the unique opportunity to go to Europe this past summer and study. anti-Israel, and so we mm. kind of were discussing why they had this huge dislike of Israel, um, and I found it quite fascinating. Their kind of common um, argument was this Jewish apartheid, almost, that was happening um, in Israel, and, and I kind of tried to say what I could uh, to... Um, kind of, I guess, rebuttal that, but really I had no experience because I've mm -hmm. never been to Israel. Mm -hmm. And so, pardon me, I wanted to take advantage of your um, knowledge of Israel and see mm -hmm. if you had any um, experience with that at all. Well, I appreciate that. It's a great question. Uh, for free around the world uh, and actually be at a Calvary, uh, Calvary Chapel of Albuquerque, uh, Skip Heitzig. And we're going to have a conference and we're going to look at this issue which uh, the term is replacement theology. In other words, why do so many people, some who call themselves Christians and then many people who don't, but, but why do they think that God is done with the Jews, that Jews do not, uh, are not prophetically given the land of Israel again? why they're occupying it, why it's, uh, they're committing atrocities. Well, and there's, all, there's a whole set of, of views, but some of them, are, and some of them are held by, by pagans. And, 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 uh, God has rejected us because our four, 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 you know, our five, six, seven fathers, whatever, our fathers way back rejected Jesus, most of them, and therefore God has rejected us. And therefore all the promises that were made to us for salvation, for making us a light to the nations, for giving us the land, that all those have been canceled. And that God has now replaced all of his promises to the Jews, and now those go to the church. So that every time you see in Scripture a promise made to Israel, you take the word Israel in this view and switch it and say, that's for the church. And this is... This is, this is a view that Israel is the oppressor, Israel is the Goliath, you know, the list goes on and on, some of the things you've described. 
So we're going to look at this for several days. Now, the way the conference is going to run, uh, you can look at it at epicenterconference.com. If you'd like to fly to Albuquerque, it's, it's free. We'd love to have you. If you want to just watch it online, it will not only be available online, but it's available sort of on demand once the conference starts. It starts September 12th. And so once this message happens, I forget if we're doing it live or if it goes up a few hours later. But you can watch all at any time, day or night. And, uh, and I would encourage you to do it. And we're going to have not only um, uh, theologians, but theologians. And should, um, because one of the things I'm concerned about is that we who do love Israel, too often people who love the Palestinians and the Palestinians themselves feel like, well, the Christians love Israel and they hate us. They ignore us or they hate us or they don't care about us. And the Christians even who are Palestinian Arabs feel like, oh, it's all Israel. And you don't even care when, you know, when uh, there was Israeli youth this, this past week who tried to lynch uh, some Palestinian young people. Why doesn't that get spoken of? I spoke out on it, against it, but, but many don't. And uh, a couple days ago, uh, s several uh, Israeli youths so I'm not going to make it at length tonight, but just to say this, and, uh, is we who love Jesus need to love Israel, but we also need to love Israel's neighbors. Now, some people say, well, they're not neighbors, they're enemies. So Jesus said, love your enemies. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Man, that really covers everybody, right? They're, you love Israel, you love the neighbors, you love the enemies. But we're not really doing that, many of us. A and we need to. We, Jesus, not, Jesus did, does give certain promises to the Jews, but he also gives us certain responsibilities that, we, that go with the promises. It's, but he loves both, right? Jesus is not against... to love both, to love the Jews and truly love them because most people hate them or don't care about them, but also to love their neighbors and their enemies. And even those that are going to be judged, especially countries that we know are going to get judged, we need to be all about reaching them with the gospel be before these things happen, right? We don't want to say, well, they're going to get judged. Good. Nuke them till they glow. No, 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 no. I mean, some of these things are going to be happen, but we, just like we didn't want that to happen to us, we don't want these to happen to other people without at least the first chance for them to hear the gospel. So I hope that the Epicenter Conference will be helpful for you. food, clothing, medical supplies, and other relief supplies to the local churches in Israel so that they can minister to Jews and Arabs in the name of Jesus. Uh, we don't, we're not building a Joshua Fund brand there with trucks and bags and all kinds of things. It goes through the local believers so that they can be witnesses to their neighbors. They can show the love of Jesus to Jews and Arabs, and then, hopefully, uh, people's hearts will be open and they'll say, all right, let's, you know, let's get a cup of coffee and let's talk about why do you believe what you believe? Why do the people who love Jesus seem to love us? And so that may be something you'd like to come and participate. We'll also have a day of humanitarian relief outreach. You'll actually get to do a project, not just talk. Peace. Now, God may say no to that prayer, but we're supposed to pray it anyway. 
Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. By the way, that's not the Arafat version. Pray for a peace of Jerusalem, then kill all the Jews and Christians, and then take it all for yourself. No, no. Psalm 122, verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But it sense because God also, Jesus also says there'll be wars in the Middle East in the last days. We pray for peace, but we need to prepare for war. And so the Joshua one is stockpiling supplies, we're getting generators, satellite phones, a lot of that is in place, but we're still buying and, 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 and preparing more. And if you'd like to help us, pray for us, with us, uh, contribute financially perhaps to the Joshua Fund, again, you can... Stand up. Uh, it's only 12 o'clock for me. It's all good. And... Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, we were in California with Caleb, otherwise it would be 3 in the morning. But anyway, um, but I'm so grateful that you would have interest in these things. Because I think these things are very much on God's heart. And we know that many are not teaching this, and they're not studying it. But, but, but the fact that you are, I, I just pray that God would bless you and would use you to, to, to take others into these scriptures. Perhaps my books will be a resource to you, but there's many others and may God use you to help others realize that God does talk about the future. He does give us a sense of what's coming and how we... ...children of God even to those who believe in his name. So let's close in prayer. And um, if any of you, let's just close your eyes and, and, and bow your head. But if any of you want to receive Christ as your Savior, just lift up your hand and I will pray with you uh, right now. And you can give your life to Christ and be absolutely certain. I don't want to assume tonight that just because you came and stayed that you've already made a decision to receive Christ. So if there's anyone... Okay, good. We see two. Anyone else want to receive the Lord tonight? I, I would hate for you to leave all of this tonight and be uncertain or, or, or that you, about whether you know Christ or not. Uh, I want you to be able to give your life to the Lord. Anyone else? Okay, good. Let your time in prayer right now be asking the Lord to forgive you according to 1 John 1 9. Okay, I see it. two more people want to receive Christ. All right, two more, three. Good. All right, anyone else want to make that decision to receive the Lord? And then the rest of you, I just ask that you make sure you're, you're getting right with the Lord in your, on, on your own terms uh, so that you're ready. And whatever, has been, whatever you've been drifting away from now, let tonight be the night that you repent, that you turn away from the way you're going and truly give your life wholly and completely to him and ask him to forgive you and get you back on track. Okay, we're going to pray. Now, what I want you to do is, those of you who want to pray to receive Christ, just follow me. You can say it out loud. or. You and really give your life to Christ. You need to believe that he died on the cross for you to pay the penalty for your sins. And you need to believe that God raised Christ from the dead to prove to you that re Jesus really is the Savior. And you need to be willing to renounce everything else and give your life wholly and completely to Jesus Christ. If you're ready to do that, uh, pray with me, and I'll, I'll say a, a, a sentence. You can just pray it out loud or, or in your heart. Why don't you follow me in prayer? Dear Father, I need you tonight. I admit...
I want to be adopted into your family. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Father, I believe that Jesus really is the Messiah. And I believe that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for all of my sins. All of my sins, past, present, and future. And I believe, Father, And Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart right now. I open the door of my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Please forgive me. Please wash me pure of my sins. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please teach me how to walk with you, how to abide in you. I don't know how to do it, but I want you to teach me. And so give me the strength to follow you, to serve you, no matter how difficult life gets here on earth. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me the Bible. Thank you that your word is true and I can put my faith in you and in your word. And I, Father, I thank you that you love me and that tonight you've adopted me into your family. And I pray these things. Joel, we've got a gift for